The New Oxford Dictionary defines racism as prejudice, discrimination, antagonism by an individual, community, or institution against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. Hard and perturse some grand scholars define racism as being the exercise of power against a racial group defined as inferior, pseudoscientific. And again, we've been fighting hard. Carter and Perturse go on to say that racism categorizes social groups into races that devalues and disempowers differentially allocates desirable societal opportunities and resources to racial groups regarded as inferior. DOC Genesis our wing club. DOC Genesis our wing club. DOC allow me to reintroduce myself. DOC Genesis our wing club. DOC Genesis our wing club. DOC allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Greetings, Amani Nine Guvu, Dr. Dennis Asar Winkler back at you again. And I want to talk about racism. This conversation is going to be kind of an off the cuff conversation, but it's also going to be a, I'm going to, I'm going to pull from my research, pull from my dissertation even as we go throughout this process. And I plan to continue to have these talks because what I realized is that although it's 2023, many of us have no idea, no idea about what racism truly is and how complex it is. We tend to look at it as uh, very simple when it's not that. Tend to miss the mark about the difference between prejudice in racism there's even an argument about can black people be racist or, or other people of color can be racist or what have you i think we miss the mark when we speak about racism because we don't understand in order to enact racism there has to be some form of power backing you let's say that again there has to be a level of power backing the individual the group or whomever is enacting that form of racism. Is that behavior de facto um, supported by law? Is it supported by uh, 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 just agreement? Is it supported by culture? Is it supported by institutions? Is it supported by those who are the majority? And if it is, we can presume that there's some level of or possibility that racism have taken place. So I want to do, I want to pull my dissertation out. You know, this is my, 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 my dissertation bound. Um, you can find that dissertation online on ProQuest. You can even find it uh, on my YouTube station. You can find it on my YouTube station under some of my videos linked um, that, that I speak about a racist event that I experienced recently here in Baltimore um, with a, I guess what I come to now find out was an investor who was helping out at a restaurant. But let's, let's look at what, what I, I've written here. It says, although the concept of race is illusory. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's look at that. Although the concept of race is illusory, Racism is not. And when I say illusory, what am I saying? I'm saying that it's not necessarily a, 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 a real thing that you can really hold on to. In fact, many of us speak to race being a social construct, and I, and I agree with that, you know. But let's, 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 let's listen to what I wrote here. Although the concept of race is illusory, racism is not. Cardin Perturse and other, and other scholars support that. Fuller, if we know 
uh, Nilly Fuller, um, one of the scholars that Dr. Francis Quest Welsing um, kind of references much. He has his book. We have his book over there. The United Independent Cons Compensatory Code System Concept. It says a textbook workbook for thought, speech, and or action for victims of racism, which he also says is white supremacy. You'll see this. This is the real old version, you know, um, running the, the original versions. So Fuller is widely noted for his statement about white supremacy, which he maintained is racism. If you do not understand, this is what Fuller says, and this is what many people have repeated if you do not understand what white supremacy is fuller says what it is and how it works everything else that you understand will only confuse you let me read that again white supremacy fuller says if you do not understand white supremacy which he says racism what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. I think that's a powerful statement. I think many times we say this, we state this, we, we quote him. That's the word I was looking for. We quote this word, what he says, but we don't understand how complex racism is and how it's being actually used against us, people of color. Uh, more specifically black people and how it is also being used against those who are considered white it, it you know it, it keeps us confused the complexity of racism keeps us at odds with one another I'm talking about those who are supposedly from different socially constructed uh, races which you know I, I despise the idea of race, but I understand the importance of it at this point. You know, because the notion of a race in its formation was racist, if I can say. That's because race is not just to say, okay, I'm black, they're white, they're yellow. See, when, when, when the idea of race was created, it, it's opposed argued pseudoscientifically that there was attributes or some inbred uh, qualities that correlated with these races how black people being lazy uh, and and so on and so forth white people being superior and the the, the greatest and Everybody else in between actually falling somewhere, you know, closer to that spectrum. Black people being lazy, d docile, dumb, need to be led. And on the other side of the spectrum, white people. White people being smart, beautiful, brilliant, and all these type of things, right? What well, I mean, obviously that's not true in 20, but however, in 2023, people still believe these things. In 2023, people still believe these things if you consciously know it or not and that's how complex race is because it is intertwined in a tapestry of our culture so let's look at some definitions of race again coming out of my dissertation the definitions of racism that, that's what I want to speak about I want to speak about the definitions of racism the definitions of racism vary across forms of literature the New Oxford Dictionary defines racism as prejudice, discrimination, antagonism by an individual, community, or institution against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. Fuller, Cabone, and Welsen, some of our grand scholars, argue that racism is a belief and a practice of superiority based on biological and genetic differences, while hard and perturse, some grand scholars, define racism as being the exercise 
of power against a racial group defined as inferior. Let's say that again. The exercise of power against a racial group defined as inferior. Again, let's look at this, this whole idea of race. See, in order to be a racism, there has to be an idea of what race is and what it means. What attributes one falls within as it pertains to the, their racial so-called stratification or the category that they fall within. Again, black being docile, lazy, uh, phlegmatic, white being superior, smart, intelligent. Not that I believe that. This is the this is what race was founded on. So the whole concept in and of itself is bogus, pseudoscientific. And again, we've been fighting hard to maintain these labels to a degree, but they fall short because what they was founded on in the first place. A lot of us, a lot of us go and we speak about not using certain words because of the etymologies and so on and so forth. But the very people who argue the etymology of words and how words have evolved still get caught up in this idea of wanting to use this concept of blackness and whiteness, which again, I don't think we can get rid of, but I think it becomes problematic. I think it, it, um, uh, it, it, it thwarts our perspective of seeing things accurately at times, but I also understand the importance of really utilizing it because it's ha it has been weaponized against us. But I feel like, and I would argue that there is a fine balance in how we utilize this idea of race. Carter and Paterks go on to say that racism categorizes social groups into races that devalues and disempowers and differently, differentially allocates desirable societal opportunities and resources to racial groups regarded as inferior. I said it again. Colin Paterce asserted that racism c categorizes social groups into races that devalues, disempowers, and differentially allocates desirable societal opportunities and resources to racial groups regarded as inferior. They, racism, we, we, I spoke about this earlier, but I, I wanna hit it here. Racism is different than personal prejudice. The, it can be argued that it is the use of group power through organizations, institutions, and the imposition of cultural preferences by the dominant cultural group. Carter and Paterce further asserted that racial discrimination is resultant of the ideology of racism that manifests in direct and indirect forms that have mental health outcomes. More broadly, racism is defined as a form of stress as it affects people mentally and physically. There's meant as much research around that. Our scholars such as Akbars and the in the um Cabones and the Nobles and the and the Hilli Hilliots and the Welsing Welsing and all of our great scholars have been speaking about this. What I what I think that Carter Paterce did a grand job of doing is really measuring this to show this is not made up stuff. Racism impacts us, it it, it, it affects us in our daily lives. It, it impacts us in our daily lives. I think what Cotton Terse did what was, was was brilliant is develop a scale that measures the impact that racism has on our psyche. And the impact that it has on our psyche also has an impact on us physiologically. This is something that we can quantify. This is something that we can measure. So it's not something that's just made up. And some people might argue against this is not racism or that is not racism or what have you. 
But the reality is this country has done us a disservice. And I think that's an understatement. This country has abused us. It has tormented us. It has violated us in ways that no other human beings in history have ever been violated. And this is not to take away from other groups. This is not to take away and say that we're entering the oppression of the Olympics. It's just a fact that we, our ancestors, our forefathers, our foremothers have been tormented, abused, and acted upon in ways that are beyond what we can call savage. Now there's others that have also experienced these things. And I'm not taking anything from them. And I think much work needs to be done in those areas, especially our Native American brothers and sisters. We definitely have to look at that. In fact, I have some Native in me. Ancestry.com tests and supports that even. So I'm not just saying that. But what I do want to say is, we, uh, people of African descent, have been impacted in some unique ways in this country that we cannot continue, or this country, or people cannot continue to look past. They can. But I'm suggesting that we're going to fight for that. We're going to fight for the... We're going to continue to fight to highlight this because we have experienced injustice to magnitudes that is incomprehensible. So incomprehensible that the, the what they call the majority culture, society, the privilege to have you. I, I don't totally agree with all these terms, but I'm using them for the sake of conversation. Doesn't even have to acknowledge that. And they call that privilege. You don't even have to realize the impact on our bodies, on African bodies, on black bodies, because... It's easier for you to not acknowledge it. Because if you acknowledge the harm that has been inflicted upon us, then what happens is you now have to deal with those feelings. You have to deal with that guilt. Some would say you don't have any guilt. I understand from a human beings from a very deep level and I understand that there's some guilt there. There's some distance there because you have to see yourself in a in an idealized way, you have to continue to see yourself as doing good. You know, you have to continue to see your forefathers and foremothers as have done, have doing, have done good work. You know, I know it's easier for us. I'm a professor at Waynesburg University. In one of my in one of my classes, there was a a prompt about Hitler and and uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and so on and so forth and they put these gentlemen uh, you know quote unquote in the same category they said these were uh, great leaders the prompt one of my students responded I don't understand how you could ever put Thomas Jefferson and George Washington in the same category as Hitler. And that's because you have blinders on. That's because we have blinders on. Even us today, as we see the dismantling of statues such as Columbus downtown in Baltimore, in, in many uh, uh, Confederate statues in the South and throughout the South. And even the North, or quote unquote, you understand? That's even a confusion. To the, the, the put people in this North and South game, which is not real. It's racism is pervasive in this country, whether you've been in the North or South. And slavery has been th all throughout. Especially on this East Coast here. But the reality is, the reality is, we can dismantle a Columbus statue. Which is, oh, which is... It, it probably took a lot. I mean, people took it down. But we got to keep old George Washington as being pious. And being, 
you know, uh, a righteous person. We got to keep old Thomas Jefferson and the rest of them as being pious and, and loving and so on and so forth. And, I, you know, if to be honest, yeah, maybe they did love and maybe they were, uh, what have you, uh, good to their people. Yes, again, their people. To their people. But they own slaves. They perpetuated the culture. They made the rules. Created the rules. Perpetuated the rules. Maintained the rules. And all of this comes to this idea of race. Which puts black men and women on the bottom of the totem pole. Deserving of that. Oh, not, not, not just deserving, but blessed to be enslaved by these quote unquote, quote unquote, beautiful white people. So getting back to what I was stating about my, 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 my student, my student, I, I had to kind of challenge her a bit and, and, and suggest that, well, you know, some would argue the same against Thomas Jefferson and George Washington as they were enslavers. Many years, racism has been overt. Many years, racism has been overt in this country. Where literally the, the feet of white people were sanctioned as okay of being on the necks and backs of black people. And you just don't enact laws and take that trauma away. Some would say that was done years ago. Yeah, but not that long ago. We're not even talking, you know, we're not even talking, uh, what, uh, was supposed to be 1865 or what have you? We 1920. We're not even talking a good 200 years. But it didn't just stop there, as I'm I'm suggesting here. It didn't stop there. It went into black codes and uh, Reconstruction and you know uh, uh, Jim Crow and and then uh, police brutality and uh, the new Jim Crow and all these type of the drug the war against drugs, which were code for destroying the black community with the opiates and the crack and all that that they put in the community in the first place. Bad black actors. You know, you understand what I'm saying? That's what I grew I grew up in the 90s and the 80s and the 90s when all that was about. Where it where, where, where media and all other forms of uh, racist assault has been taking place and continue to take place to this day. Because they use all forms, all types of weapons against us. So let's get to the uh, to a, 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 a aspect of my dissertation entitled "The Pervasive and Insidious Nature of Racism." We spoke about the overt, out in your face, your feet on our necks version of racism. But let's go here. Various scholars argue that racism happens on all levels and aspects of human interaction, which have been broken down into nine areas by our brother Neely Fuller. He says that racism operates on all levels in, in, in these nine areas, including economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. And I say, although our dear Elder Baba put this out here, that you can extend this list even. But I think he did a good job to say it is in all levels. It's fought through the economic system. It's fought through the education system. These are weapons. The education that we receive in our schools are being used against us. Economically, we understand how economically still to this day, the, the, the business class, which is, or, the, or those who control the resources, which is not us, have the power, have been granted the power, have been given stimuluses, who have been given 
the greatest form of welfare since the, 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 the construction of this country here. Through labor, controlling us through labor, controlling us through law. There's a book, uh, The Color of Law, that you probably should read. Politics, every day there's a fight just a few days ago. So you see this in the expulsion of Justin Pearson and Justin Jones from uh, Memphis, Tennessee State House. First, the first that of this type because they were standing up against gun control. There was a there was a white lady, you know, and she was also standing up and protesting, but she was not expelled from the state house. You know, some would say, how do you support that's racism? She even suggested that it was racist. Why? She, they asked her, why were you not expelled? She said, basically alluded to the fact that it's not a secret what has taken place. And she herself, race of these brothers, compared to her own. So getting back to what I was reading here, we were speaking about uh, these areas that Neely Fuller spoke about as it relates to racism. Cardin Baturs argued that racism pervades individual, institutional, and on cultural levels in our society. However, racism is often viewed as aspect of one's personal character versus the systemic processes of racism. So racism is all, is, is many of us are deluded to believe that racism has to do with one's personal act against another. One's character, if I'm a good person against a I'm a good person. I, 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 I have black friends and you know all this type of thing. It's much more complex than that. The, the fact is you can literally believe that you're doing good for others, people of color, black people, and still be maintaining racism, a racist system, a system of oppression. And it, and it happens all day long. Because, again, as I stated earlier, it's very complex. Racism is so complex. When you think you're fighting it, you're supporting it many times. So we have to have very deep, serious conversations. It's, it's, it, we're past the point where we can continue to have these very simple conversations. I'm talking about everyone. You know, we have to have very complex and controlled conversations so that we can really go deeper into how racism impacts every level of our reality, our culture. And the fact is, racism not only hurts black people, the ideology behind it creates a certain level of trauma in white people. Racism not only impacts, again, as I stated earlier, black people, it also impacts other people of color, including those who are the perpetrators of it. Because, and I'm talking about overt forms of it even, and I'm talking about it, racism impacts how you see yourself or how you feel inside. You know, people can talk all day about how they aren't racist, but you would not dare see them live in a community with a certain percentage of black people either. You don't see them fighting against injustices such as we experience in real estate where you can live in the same com 
type of community. No, no, no. It could be a black community that's very luxurious. And when you look at the the value of the homes in this community, when you and compare them against a community where the the majority are white, and these are not, and this is not a luxurious community. The actually the how the, the the value of the houses are much higher many times in those communities. This is also structural and systematic systematic forms of racism. Because when we're looking at uh, economics, a safe way to practice racism is to price out black people. It, 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 it's a very, uh, you know, you can't point to it, but you, you can't point it out all the time. But it's a reality. You don't want to live with them you don't want them around you you don't want them around your children even though you may want to help them that is real Colin Paterce continue continue by saying definitions of racism that relegate racism to individuals character maintains in the minds of white people that African Americans and other people of color must obtain their level of so social status without prefer preferential treatment Research supports that white people in America tend to believe that racialized groups are doing well in life and that racism is no longer an issue. You see that? Again, it's easier to believe that. It's easier to not really see the injustice that's taking place in front of you. In fact, you can, again, create a world that you don't even have to deal with these people. You don't have to know what's going on in their daily walks and lives and so on and so forth. Because you created a whole utopic, quote unquote, uh, 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 world of your own. You don't have to drive through the communities that I drive through. You don't have to drive through or walk beside the people that we walk by. You don't have to know what's going on inside of our communities. I'm talking about black community, the black community and other communities of color, but I'm specifically speaking about the black community because you have created a world of your own where you don't have to deal with it. And I think that I, I, I want to even talk about how it's uh, insidious and how pervasive racism is because I'll take racism to internalized forms of racism where we are black people and racism is perpetuated through the media and these other forms education and uh, all these other levels that we internalize these messages even where we can live in a community and the community is very peaceful they might have a few people who are acting out but in our minds we begin to uh, we see the issue and we see the issues in our communities and the problems and the people being problems in our community greater than what it really is and truly is. We begin to believe that and we start to uh, characterize certain behaviors as what black people do. We believe black people are people like they we, we, we sell, and sell and take drugs and that's what you think about when you think about a drug dealer but the biggest drug dealers are not black people. And the people who use most of the drugs aren't black. Many times black people are using as a way to cope in this society. And typically is not the younger. When you, when you look at the statistics, you'll see that white younger people use drugs at greater levels. And even harder drugs than younger people. You'll start to see it, it increases with when, when you, we increase with age that black people begin to take drugs. But I, uh, now from my idea of that is that just it's a way to cope with the world and I'm not suggesting that other people aren't trying to cope with this reality because it's bad on everybody the way that the society has been set up capitalistic in nature which again is intertwined with racism is which because it's economic cool so it goes on to say, research supports that white people in America believe that racialized groups are doing well in life 
and that racism is no longer an issue. Furthermore, it is the belief of whites that no accommodations are needed for past acts of oppression, which supports resentment towards people of color. See that? That's what I'm talking about. So this is the real belief. Racism is, is so tricky that sometimes, I, I just want to slow down for my brothers and sisters here, is that sometimes we believe that white people know more than what they know. <laughs> the masses of white people know more than what they know. No, they, 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 they're misled as well. And they are also resentful because they're being played. They're being played. And they, they believe the messaging of a Trump. Some of these white people in middle America cannot imagine that black people are still oppressed because they're looking at TV just like you are. They see the black people out here, so you know, as some will call tokens, being presented before them as being successful while they're still living in the trailer park. They still see the uh, black imagery saying, look, look how, look at the opportunities of, that black people had. And then they start saying, well, the president of the United States was black at one time. How could they still be oppressed? I mean, the reality is they really believe this. In fact, some of us believed it. <laughs> so it's, it's a trick. It's a trick on our minds. And I often say our behinds because how we think controls how we behave. And many times we say we have, we no longer have been enslaved on a, uh, and we, on a physical level, but I say, man, if you are enslaved on a psychological level, which ultimately controls the physical, yeah, bro, yeah, sis, yeah, they still got us physically as well. It goes on to say, white people tend to define racism to being blatant, overt, and intentional acts However, having such a limited definition of racism lends to acknowledging very few facts or very few acts of racism because most people will not admit to intentionally wanting to harm others due to race. So, and this is what happened, you know, with me. I was, I was accosted by a white lady down in a restaurant a few weeks ago. Out of all the people she came over to me, you know, the brother who came in ordered his food and I'm, you know, I ordered my food and I step off to the side. I step off to the side because I ordered my food. I'm now on the way. I'm waiting for my food. They have a, they have a, a, a open mic going on. I find a position where I'm not blocking anyone. I then begin to ruminate because I have a, an event going on. Uh, the next day, um, a, a race-based traumatic uh, a, a, a healing circle, which is in, the, the, the name of the circle is a For the People Community Healing and Enrichment Circle, where racism is, we're trying to tackle the impact that racism has on us psychologically and viscerally in this circle, on our people, because that's the purpose. But I'm in and I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about what's going on and how I'm going to prepare. And next thing I know, I caught a gaze or, 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 or I thought I was gazing at this white lady because she was looking directly at me. And I'm thinking because I'm ruminating, she, she th she's thinking I'm staring at her. So I kind of shift my gaze. When I shift my gaze, I, I start, I begin to ruminate again. Next thing I know, she comes over to me and say, how can I help you? And I say, mm. I say, oh no, um, I, uh, I already ordered. And then she says, what's your name? And I say, um, uh, uh, Dennis. And keep in mind, I'm in this restaurant and 90%, of, no, probably 99% of people are, are, are white. And they're on the stage, they're having a good old time, you know, you know. And it's one, it's, it's another brother Who's sitting down? He has an Oreos um, um, get up on. And as she walks off, after she asks me, asks, asks my name, I, I 
catch eyes with him and he shakes his head. So I'm saying, wow, okay. So he saw that too. Cause she came to me in a very assertive, if not aggressive manner, asking me, how can I help you? And, it, and she wasn't even that close. So this guy could hear that. He saw the interaction. Then she seemed as if she didn't believe me. So she asked me my name and I say, Dennis. So she goes back and I don't know what happened. At some point, a table becomes available. I sit at a table to uh, create a post to suggest, uh, to, to kind of put out that we're having the circle um, the next day. And and before I can even post it, I'm looking for the picture of the of the flyer. And next thing I know, she comes back over, over to me and say something uh, like, uh, what do you say you were here for again? And I said, I'm waiting on my food. And then I said, I thought it clicked in me like, okay. So I, then I say, so, uh, but why are you asking me that again? I, I already told you. And then she said, she gets irate instead of saying, well, I apologize or what have you. She just, she gets irate and, and we, and then she at some point tells me I can get out because I didn't order any food and people who uh, uh, support the restaurant order food and drinks and so on and so forth. And you know, that's, this is the quick, this is the quick skinny of things. But nonetheless, at some point, I, I, tell, I said, I ordered food. She walks off though. She walks off at, you know, oh no, she asked me my name again even. Like she didn't already ask me my name. So then I say, by the way, Dr. Dennis Winkler. And she says, yes, my name, and my name is Barbara. So it's kind of like, at some point, like she just becomes more aggressive. Like she wants to match whatever the energy I just gave out. And by the way, Dr. Winkler, oh, uh oh, and my name is Barbara. No, she didn't just match it. She wanted to exceed it. I pulled my camera out and then she uh, said, oh, I'm done with this. I'm not for this. I'll take care of this quickly. And then she walks off. At this point, I kind of follow her with my camera and I'm repeating what had taken place. I'm repeating what taken place for the camera, for those who will view the film later and also to keep, you know, uh, a log of what took place. Um, so. I come in the back and I have the camera on still and I say she 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 said I didn't order anything and and and, and she keeps coming back over to me I don't know why she did that and so on and so forth and then she says do you, you have, have to, to keep, keep repeating, repeating yourself? yourself now I'm accustomed to keep that in mind keep in mind that she never apologized about anything she never apologized about when I asked her like oh, why are you asked me again I already told you she just got more irate customer service would say the customer is right and oh I'm sorry um, you know what have you um, there was some confusion with your order or wh whether you ordered or not none of that she just supposed that I didn't order anything and I was taking advantage of the place in the establishment some people questioning whether this was race an act of racism or not are you security she says I don't have to say anything to you and then at some point towards me close and I say get, get out of my face please and she says I'm not going anywhere and then the owner of the restaurant sitting there like I don't know what's going on I don't know what happened I don't know what happened you know and I say can you ask her to get out of my face please they she never apologizes for this lady been in my face I'm a customer you know none of that took place it's some black brothers there who's kind of like man I'm sorry da, da, da. the owner of the restaurant never to this day apologize however her sister did send a message and she said she was saddened about my experience. Her sister had nothing to do with the restaurant. She was saddened by the experience and she thought and she thanked me for my uh, anti-racism work or nonetheless. But nonetheless, she also let me know that they'll be closing down and so on and so forth. And I looked at some reviews and things. I see that the late the owner of the restaurant had some issues with the actual establishment um, with customer service in general. And I later come to find out this lady was an investor. And perhaps maybe she didn't want to step to the the owner of the, uh, I mean, the, the, the investor because she was hoping that this would be a way that she could save her family business. This is an assumption, this is my, you know, but nonetheless, I don't know why she didn't step to the lady's face. But at some point in, in the interaction, I, I, I suggest to the owner because this lady just gets worse, she she doesn't back down. And even when she steps away from my face, she's pointing at pointing at me through a jacket, talking with her, just pointing at me like, yeah, this guy, you know, stuff like that. And then I say, she just gets worse. She just gets worse. And then I, I say to her, to the owner, I say, she doesn't know what racism is, does she? 
you know, some some people would say, well, yeah, obviously she knew what racism is. She was overtly being racist. Now, what I mean by that is I was giving her the benefit of the doubt, you know, and I was also saying that, again, as I started this presentation off or this conversation off, is that racism is, just, racism is so uh, complex that you don't even have to know consciously that you are um, behaving in a racist manner, you know, and so I got a lot of feedback from I assume people who uh, who don't believe racism exists uh, saying that how do you prove that this is racism this isn't racism this is just an argument now first and foremost I'm the only person being accosted I'm probably like uh, one, less than one percent of the the patrons in this restaurant this lady came over to me and no one else you know she never ever backed down no one in the in the in the restaurant actually ever um uh apologize and besides the black gentleman uh the owner did not apologize now let's keep in mind when we talk about uh economics right um when we're looking at this from a from from an economics perspective we understand that this lady may have been an investor no it's she's an investor um, according to the owner's sister and also someone on IG who also called the owner. So I have two accounts to substantiate that from various two, two different sources. So now, look, this lady has some financial capital. And now the owner doesn't want to back, doesn't know what to do. You know, when I suggested that this may be racism, she says, oh, I hope that's not it. Uh, uh, and she gets, and then at some point I say, that's exactly what it is. I'm, I'm a race-based expert or something like that and you know and, and this is exactly that is that is exactly what it is and she says well I hope not I, I hope not and then she freezes like she just goes blank and I and I again I think racism I would suggest that racism impacts us on visceral levels it impacts our bodies it, it we it sends us into fight flight freeze or faint and I would suggest that that lady, racism in her body, it, it was viscerally charging her to fight. You understand? Because she saw a black man that charged her viscerally, which angered her consciously or unconsciously, and she wants to step to me. And I'm, I'm later finding out this is what people are calling Karens. So she feels like she's obligated to step to the black man. You understand? And she's going to, and, and even when uh, she found out that I had placed the order, she never apologized. She still didn't back down and she continued the uh, poor behavior. The owner never apologized. She actually froze, which again happens on racism, happens on a visceral level. So it was from my assumption is that she froze and when, when, when she was charged or her establishment was charged as having been racist or the person having been racist the other lady was fighting she froze and potentially also because she froze because it's overwhelming because this is an, this is an investor that she's hoping things work out and it doesn't seem like it's working out because you know and now she freezes because it's too overwhelming for her to deal with I hope not. I, I I hope not. She says, and then she just blanks out, and it looks like she dissociates. And then she goes out for a few seconds, and then she comes back like, oh, and she shakes out of it and says, oh, um, but, but how can I take care of you or something like that? When you don't know, when you're not educated, or you don't know the complexity of racism, you you will say a thing like that. You will say, where's the racism in that? Because as we, we spoke about earlier, white people believe that racism are overt, blatant acts. So now you have people questioning whether this was racism or this wasn't racism. And that they're suggesting that I'm throwing the race car. And one thing you would probably, if you learn anything about me, that I don't just throw around these things. And I don't even want to, and I'm not a victim-minded person. Because white people do not scare me. You understand what I'm trying to say? I'm a warrior for this. You understand? I, you know, I, I, they don't scare me. I will fight for this, and I fight for this. And do I think all white people uh, uh, are trying to hurt me? No, 
I don't think all white people are trying to hurt me, but do I, but do I understand that people hurt you unintentionally? Yes, they do. Do people hurt you out of their level of ignorance? Yes, they do. Do white people and other people have a misunderstanding and a very simple idea about what racism is? Yes, they do. Racism is complex. It's not these simple, uh, overt, blatant acts. Racism is, 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 is complex, even more complex because the trauma that has been inflicted on our forefathers and mothers that have been passed down. And we talk about uh, being trauma informed as it pertains to working and intervening on, on, on academic to clinical levels and in, in societal and workplaces and all this thing. But nobody hardly wants to talk about how black people deal with trauma as a relates of racism, what can be called race-based trauma, and they're dealing with it every day. But nobody, not hardly anyone, wants to deal with that. It, and one thing I realized is it's much easier to deal with all these other schools of what we call multiculturalism because race is a very difficult thing to deal with. It's a very difficult uh, topic or discussion because we're viscerally charged, but we got to do something with that. We got to work through that in order to really make and bring about real change because if, if we don't deal with it. And what happens many times, what happens many times is, and what I'm seeing is, although black people are the ones who, who, who I'm going to say created the model of social justice. And I'm not going to say, I'm going to suggest maintain it and, and, and posit it very strongly. We are the ones who created these models of social justice. We created the models of reform. I'm talking about this particular country. We created these models and that everyone else that falls under the multicultural umbrella are utilizing to this day. Social justice, civil rights, black liberation and black power movements which later became uh, uh, women and, and, and uh, all other types of people who have been oppressed in this country have utilized since then LGBTQ plus community, uh, all type of uh, uh, people who are not able, uh, people who have been discriminated because their age, people who have been discriminated from so for so many different reasons. When I see that we put these together, even in the classes I teach, most of the people in my classes, most of my students because I teach at a PWI, they don't want to touch race so much. It's easier, and it may, it may it's easy to talk about ages, ageism. It's easy to talk about uh, 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 the issues with the LGBTQ plus community. It's easy to talk about um, other forms of oppression, but when it comes to race, and I'm saying these, all these forms of oppression need to be talked about. All these forms of oppressions need to be dealt with. All these forms of oppression are oppressive and we need to fight against them. Or really, as one of my elders, one of my babas say, we need to fight for justice for all these disenfranchised, oppressed groups. But let, look, we cannot continue to, to discard the very group of people who have brought these, who fought this fight. Even in the field of psychology, many times you hear about uh, different forms of multiculturalism and different forms of feminist psychology and all these other, uh, even queer psychology, but you never hardly hear about those who preceded those forms of psychology like black psychology or Afrocentric psychology is not often taught in our schools. It's not even hardly mentioned. There's, you don't see a picture in the books. You don't see uh, the, the, the Akbars and the nobles and, the, and those who came before them that fought for this black psychology often mentioned. You don't hear about the Fanons very much. You understand what I'm saying? But you hear about those and you and you have chapters dedicated in their psychological theories or, or counseling theories uh, books. But you don't have chapters dedicated to 
black psychology, African psychology, black liberation psychology. We don't have chapters for that, although they have created the model, the template that others are using today to carry on the fair fight. So we got to deal with that. Enough of relegating it to not uh, lifting it up and highlighting it and including it in the talk and the discussion because it's a hard talk. But we have to deal with that if we really are talking about uh, anti-racism. We have to deal with that if we talk about multiculturalism. We have to deal with that and we have to go past this idea of um, this individual model of psychology which deals with one person in the, in, in the office. I'm a, I'm a psychotherapist. I work with one person at a time. I work with families at a time. I work with groups. But we have to take this to a societal level. When we talk about social justice or we talk about advocacy, many times I get papers from my students where they're talking about teaching the, 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 the person inside the counseling room to advocate for themselves. When I'm talking about advocacy, I am talking about a level of advocacy that advocates for social reform, so change or you know, dismantling in creation of a system that is uh, beneficial for human beings. Not this advocacy that the, or, 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 or teaching us just to cope inside of these oppressive systems. So again, racism is pervasive in the cities. It's not overt and blatant all the time. In fact, it's become more complex. You know how it is when you're in a relationship with somebody. When you're in a relationship with somebody, they, they, they might be aggressive and they might be abusive. And the next thing you know that you, you call them out for their stuff and then they find ways to be passive aggressive. And that's how you can look at microaggressions. Because they, you, you, when, when you have an abusive party that are, are trying to inflict a, 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 a harm on you, when you call them out, they find slick ways to continue to, to torment you without being caught. Or, or be doing so. It's kind of like when you talk about uh, people in abusive relationships when they gaslight you, act like they don't see a thing and it's not happening. Oh, duh, well, that didn't happen. Well, that's that's that making you feel like you're crazy. And this is what they and this is what this society, this is what our education system, this is what the social, economic, political system has tried has attempted to do to black people and not attempted to do. They are doing it. They are doing it. Trying to make us feel as if what has happened has not happened when it's happened. It's not about racism, uh, you know, and I, I wanna be clear, I wanna be clear. Lots of things have happened to us. Lots of things have happened to black people in this country, brutality, overtly. The breaking up of our families, our communities, the infusion of drugs in our communities being lynched, hanged, shackled, murdered, emasculated, raped, pillaged, all types of things that happen to us. But again, Trauma impacts all involved. Trauma impacts the person who is shot and the person who's doing the shooting. In order for someone to shoot you in the first place, it's indicative that there's a certain level of fear and possibly a high level of trauma. And when you've been through a level of trauma when you've been traumatized you're pretty fearful there's a there's, there's a sense that you have some mental health issues so we we, we got to look at this thing on a on a mental health on a societal level we cannot we, we can but I'm arguing that mental health we can find we can find that mental health at a group level or mental illness at a group level 
And I'm suggesting, I will suggest, argue, maintain, defend that those people who are oppressive, we need to look at their mental health. Yes, yeah, yeah, we, we need to focus on ours. Yes, we do. But we have to call out the savagery. We have to call out the narcissistic personality traits that, that are part of a culture, a society, a people that will perform certain acts. And again, we're speaking in generalizations. I'm speaking in generalizations. And does, is this inclusive for everyone? No, it's not. And, and, and let me go back to, let me circle back here again. Williams, a scholar, noted that even good people enact racism. Hmm. I said it again. Williams noted that even good people enact racism. You might say they're not good at the race. I'm telling you that racism can be very conscious and also unconscious. And it is. And that's what makes it even more powerful. You know, one of the things I often say is that people can do more harm in the name of good than they can do in the name of bad. When people believe that they are just in doing harm, man, you got a force behind you. And the ideology of race as a concept supported ide racism as a practice. The idea of race as a concept has supported enactment. It has supported racist behaviors because people do better or more harm when they feel like they're just in doing it. Racism has evolved and is often not clearly visible as it is deeply ingrained in American society and taught to subsequent generations, to subsequent generations culturally. Again, I'm reading out of my dissertation. Pierce argued that racism is a mental disorder. He said this, this is what I was alluding to earlier. Dr. Pierce, psychiatrist who really brought about this idea of microaggressions. And this is what he said. Most offensive actions are not gross and crippling. They are subtle and stunning. The normity of the complications that they cause can be appreciated only when one considers that these subtle blows are, the di are, are delivered incessantly. Even though any single negotiation of offense can injustice be considered itself to be relatively innocuous. The cumulative effect to the victim and to the victimizer is of an unimaginable. Hence, the therapist is obligated or obliged to pose the idea that offensive mechanisms are usually microaggressions as opposed to gross, dramatic, obvious macroaggressions. And, and, and this is not a part of this uh, of, of that particular quote but I want to further that by saying microaggressions are considered to be small racial acts that are not clearly racially motivated microaggressions take place whenever people of color engage with the white majority says Sue and, and colleagues they create uncertainty and anxieties in African Americans and other ethnic racial minority groups microaggressions are deniable acts of racism that support pathological stereotypes inequitable social norms power differentials and communicate exclusion however it is important to note that microaggressions are many times unconscious acts due to them being culturally inculcated into the offenders. I'm going to close the book on that one. This culture has produced a mental illness 
a social mental illness in its dominant society that need they need to heal too you know we often talk about we didn't get the healing yeah yeah we need to heal we need to do the work and we've been doing the work and we do the work but no 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 we gotta point this out they gotta do the work too now some of y'all say they can't they you know this just part of them i don't believe that they some of us think it's innately a, a part of them i don't believe that i have examples of where that doesn't apply um, Dr. Amos Wilson even speaks about it, where he says, you know, on an individual level, you can have good old white people. That's true. But as a group, that's what I'm talking about. They need to heal. As a group, as a collective, generalizing, yes. But you do generalize the group. And those who are good old white people, yeah, it's hard for them to stand up against their group. And with that family, community, world, brothers and sisters, human beings, everyone of all races, classes, gender, whatever you want to call it, we have to deal, we have to heal at the society, the societal level. We have to heal at the societal level. Yeah, we can do the, the one-on-ones and therapy, but boy, oh boy, we gotta, we gotta start at the top. We gotta start with those in power. We gotta, we gotta start with the community. We gotta heal the society. We got people in power that maintain racist politics. We got people at the top that's maintaining uh, uh, policies and, and procedures and rules and all that to support, maintain, hurt the majority of our society while benefiting them or so they think. Peace and power.